Welcome to this uh, lecture series on aspects of western philosophy module 26. This lecture is uh, trying to outline the philosophical contributions of one uh, very important and uh, even when you measure it in terms of contemporary relevance in that way most important I would say philosopher Karl Marx. We can actually approach uh, Karl Marx philosophy from uh, two three directions, one is to see him as uh, continuation in continuation with uh, the, the great philosophical tradition uh, in Germany Kant, then from Kant you know the idealistic tradition is taken to a different heights by uh, Hegel, but there is one important aspect about Hegel's philosophy, he is addressing a particular problem the problem of alienation. He is trying to respond to this problem and uh, as we have seen in the previous lecture, he outlines the development of the spirit, the phenomenology of the spirit or the development of the spirit as a historical process, which begins from consciousness and proceeds to self consciousness and from there culminates in reason. And in this way Hegel would try to overcome the problem of alienation, where uh, the individual self or individual mind realizes that it is a manifestation of the universal mind. So, all differences all contradictions are overcome at that stage the final stage of reason, where uh, the ultimate synthesis of infinite with the finite takes place that is Hegel. But you know we can see that there are so many aspects of Hegel, which we would find reappearing in Marxian philosophy, but in a different way as he belongs to the left Hegelian group. He tries to provide an interpretation of history, which is totally different from his predecessor Hegel. He while Hegel was trying to spiritualize reality, Karl Marx he retains the historical approach of uh, Hegel, but he is trying to provide a materialistic account he is trying to provide a materialistic account of history. So, that is something which you are going to examine in this lecture the historical materialism, where uh, the materialistic conception of history is outlined, which would be followed by a discussion of the base structure and superstructure division, which he maintains in his philosophy. And ultimately we will try to see the in this course the development of history, the development of social history of man would explain the different stages and which according to Karl Marx culminates in classless society that is what we are going to see in this lecture. So, we will begin with an examination a brief outline of uh, the materialistic conception of history and its important concerns. Number one as I have already mentioned it is addressing the problem of human freedom and alienation. I would rather say this is one of the prime concerns of Marx which actually makes him relevant even today. When we talk about philosophers a philosophers relevance in the history, we normally what we mean by that is you know a philosopher is relevant in the what you call in the history of philosophy or in the history of ideas he is very relevant and even today contemporary philosophers also owe a lot to him. So, in that sense many of these thinkers we mention in the history of philosophy of are relevant, but when it comes to practical applications hardly anyone can compete with uh, Karl Marx. Marxian philosophy is not just a philosophy for contemplation, it is a philosophy of action, it is a philosophy of practice and it is a philosophy that ultimately aims at transforming the world or even in that sense reality. So, that is the importance of uh, Karl Marx as he famously stated once philosophers have either to only interpreted the world, but the point is to change it. So, his philosophy is an attempt to do that and in order to make such changes he has to come up with an understanding of philosophy an understanding of human reality. And this understanding of philosophy and human reality is initiated with materialistic conception of history, where he starts by addressing the problem of human freedom and alienation. Then again to overcome this problem of alienation Marx proposes that we have to change the world and understand that human reality is essentially historical like Hegel, but here as I mentioned 
he provides a materialistic account of history. So, it is historical materialism, where he says that the proletariat, the working class plays a very important role, extremely crucial role in changing the world and also overcoming alienation by changing the world. So, these are the things which we are going to discuss today and uh, now let us start with historical materialism. It is an attempt to explain the origin and development of the society from a materialistic perspective, why how human societies have emerged. In fact, Marcion account is uh, really comprehensive, because he starts with the human origin, how human beings have evolved following the insights from Darwinian philosophy or Darwinian approaches. Karl Marx also adopts a kind of very scientific and very rational path in which he explains the evolution of humankind, the evolution of man from the animal world, the, uh, the, uh, the emergence of uh, the emergence of man, the emergence of man as a social being, the emergence of uh, societies or social history of man all these things are outlined in his comprehensive philosophical thinking. Historical materialism deals with the most general laws of social development, that is one way in which Marx conceives his philosophy, he says that it is scientific philosophy. Scientists are generally interested in or trying to understand the universal laws behind natural phenomena. So, here historical phenomena is uh, analyzed and Karl Marx is trying to arrive at those universal laws which guide or which determine the process of historical phenomena. The general laws of social development is something which he is trying to describe with an explanation of uh, the historical materialism and it is against all the idealistic understanding of history with, with a scientific and materialistic conception. He is definitely inspired by the, the evolution theory of evolution proposed by Charles Darwin. Let us look at the pre Marxian views about history, there are different accounts of history even as we have seen Hegel himself provides an account where he tries to see as a creative process in which the spirit unfolds itself and realizes itself and culminates in the absolute. So, here there are different versions where history is created by people their consciousness and will and uh, there are some philosophers who conceive history as uh, constitutive of uh, supernatural forces as the these forces deciding the destiny of people, then ideas or theories determine the course of history all these are different ways in which you know pre Marxian thinkers have approached the whole phenomenon called history and try to understand it. But Marx provides a very important very significantly very different view of history where he also tries to explain the development of society as a process where uh, material conditions are being underlined. Now, society according to him develops in accordance with certain laws which are independent of the wishes and desires of people. See it is like any other law, any other scientific law, scientific laws are or natural laws are not they do not function according to the wishes and desires of people. So, they are universal and objective in the sense that they are not our creations, they do not function according to our wishes and desires. So, when Marx tries to introduce his uh, conception of history or his philosophy which he says is scientific, he is also searching for such universal objective scientific laws that are independent of the wishes and desires of people that would guide the development of society or the process of social development. So, development of society can be seen as a process of social production that is the, the most important aspect of Marcion approach. It is a process of social production from human evolution from the apes to the complex society or social formations he is trying to outline this history. So, what is it the process of social production uh, what happens is that uh, men came together and enter into definite relations that are indispensable and independent of their wills and desires. So, this is at the crux of Marxian understanding of social development, he identifies labor and protection as extremely significant and extremely important aspects of human reality. And then he uh, tries to show that this activity of protection is uh, essentially a social activity where people have to come together and uh, as society develops you know there is a lot of cooperation between the people is needed and as a result protection becomes social protection 
where uh, people have to enter into definite kinds of relationships, different kinds of relationships and these laws according to which they enter into such kinds of relationship with each other, with nature and with various things and artifacts are not something which happens according to their wishes and desires, they are independent of their will and desire. Now, what is it? Uh, here uh, let us look at uh, Darwin's theory and the Marxian appropriation of this theory or the communist the appropriation by Engels another very important thinker in the development of uh, Marxism. So, Charles Darwin uh, had uh, stated that he tried to provide a scientific explanation for uh, man's origin in his theory of evolution he traces man's origin to the animal world as all of us know that uh, we have our predecessors in the animal world the apes and this provides an account of the discovery of the law of development of organic nature. How in a creative conflict in a creative interaction with nature and surroundings different organisms different species different animals evolved and ultimately the evolution of man with consciousness. So, this is what Darwin was trying to do with his uh, scientific explanation of uh, the origin of species. Frederick Engels though in principle accepts this he, he further takes it and uh, explains how labor plays a key role in the origin of man. So, this is the Marxian contribution to the theory of uh, evolution theory of evolution of species evolution of man. So, recognizing the important role played by labor an account of the scientific discovery of the law of development of human history. So, what he says is our ancestors learnt how to make use of their front extremities for simple operations which are prehensible functions. The differentiation of hand from foot the emergence of labor. So, that state is very important in the history the evolution of man uh, the human species. Suddenly, they realize that the hands can be differentiated from the foot and can be used for different functions. You can handle something and uh, with hand you can do certain things it is a tool now and uh, since you can do certain things you need greater brain hand coordination. This becomes a necessity in order to use the hand as a tool you need great, greater contribution greater sharpness of the brain. So, gradually brain also developed and then ultimately consciousness developed and since you can use your hand for doing several things you can have a social life you can come together all kinds of social developments also follow. So, this is how you know the process of evolution is being further described by the Marxian philosophers the differentiation of hand from foot this brought people closer together and stimulated mutual assistance and joint activity and later insights to the natural laws governing life which uh, ultimately led to the development of uh, sciences and other technological activities which actually were responsible for human civilization. Again it is a process of reacting to nature in a certain way. So, there are different stages let us briefly outline them the differentiation of hand from foot which I have already mentioned erection gate is a very important state where you know this differentiation happened that you can really get up and stand on your two legs and uh, where you do not have to support your entire body with your two hands and the two hands and are right are, are, are free now you can use it as a tool the emergence of labor and production people coming together out of uh, and together with the labor process emergence of language like when people come together they would start interacting and in that process of interaction language develops and with language a consciousness emerges and the conditions of separate useful actions also evolve. Now, a little bit on labor and production specialization of a hand where you can employ it like a tool and make changes in nature you can hold certain things you can throw you can make changes in the world with your hand and this is a very important stage in the process of evolution and a specific human activity called production actually becomes relevant in this context. So, historically genetically this evolution process is very important and production plays a very important role in taking it further. People come together and cooperate so, this is what is called social production this is a quote from Karl Marx on the right hand side you would see a model of a spider web. So, Marx says the spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells, but what designates the worst 
architect from the best of bees is this that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. At the end of every labor process we get a result that already existed in the imagination of the laborer at its commencement. He not only affects a change of form in the material on which he works, but he also realizes a purpose of his own. So, it is something which comes from inside of the laborer. So, the production or labor production activity is where something which is internally there in imagination which is already existent is being materialized. So, in one sense we can say that the essence is being materialized in the process of production. So, that is why labor or production plays a very important role in Marxian philosophy and it is very closely associated with the notion of speech and then from there to consciousness. So, this is what Engel says I quote labor and speech were the two essential stimuli under the influence of which the brain of the ape gradually changed into that of man. Hand in hand with the development of the brain went the development of its most immediate instruments the senses. So, everything speech senses everything developed which ultimately led to the evolution of man as the intelligent creature he is today. So, here uh, these are some of the interesting aspects of uh, the materialistic conception which uh, Marx is trying to initiate. It is different from other conceptions of materialism. For example, there is a notion of metaphysical materialism where uh, philosophers would argue that matter determines consciousness and idealism on the other hand as just an opposite view, view where consciousness determines matter and dialectical materialism where matter determines consciousness which in turn influences matter. So, it is a creative interactive dialectical process that Marx envisages. Now, it is this conception which is associated with the notion of alienation which Marx conceives as the most significant philosophical and material worry of humankind. Overcoming alienation is the greatest human task which Marx is trying to achieve or accomplish with the help of his materialistic understanding of this reality particularly human reality. Now, objects of labor what do you mean by objects of labor all those things earth plant and animal world the objects acted upon by man with his equipment tools and other things. So, this is object of labor and when you talk about means of labor or productions things that people place between themselves and the object of labor are uh, the means of labor or production. They are instruments of labor like axe, so eight machines etcetera. We are trying to outline the components of production of material wealth. Again you have the productivity forces of society which uh, constitute the knowledge and skill of the working people which is inevitable for the creation of material wealth and it characterizes the material relations between society and nature. And when you talk about the other component production relations it is based on the ownership of the means of production. These are some of the important components and now we we will try to outline their important relationships which would explain Marxian philosophy in a comprehensive fashion. So, let us talk about mode of production. So, there is the productive forces on the one hand and production relations on the other hand which constitute a mode of production. What mode of production a particular society follows is determined by the productive forces which we have already seen the knowledge and skill of the working people and then the production relations which is nothing but based on the ownership who owns the means of production. So, that matters see for example, according to Marxian theory there are different stages of human evolution. One particular stage for example, feudalism the land is owned by certain feudal lots and there are peasants and other workers who are landless workers who actually have no control over the wealth of the society. So, based on that you know their relationship with nature the relationship with their objects of work and the relationship with the owners of work all these constitute production relations. So, you have productive forces and production relations they constitute the mode of production of a particular society. In a capitalist society this mode of production would be of a different kind and in a feudal society it will be of another kind.
they exist as objective reality independently of the desire, will and consciousness of people. This is some, what something I, I mentioned some time back when I said you know he was trying to outline the universal laws of history like a scientist would try to outline the universal laws of nature, changes and develops all the time. So, this is another aspect of Marxian philosophy he says that it is a historical process it is not static the mode of production which depends on the productive forces and production relations keep on changing. So, from feudalism to capitalism there is a very significant change. Now, the capitalists are the owners of factories and technologies and other things and the propertyless working class or proletariat we call them their relationship is different from the kind of relationship they have with nature within themselves and with their the capitalist is different from the kind of relations that existed during the feudal era. Now, changes in development is production is initiated by changes in production relations. Marx is trying to gradually outline the process of historical change, what happens, how change takes place. Changes in production relations lead to transformation of the entire social system, social ideas and political views which make up uh, the superstructure of any society. So, it is this production relationship which is very crucial the nature of this relationship the changes that take place within this relationship it actually leads to a kind of transformation uh, uh, the entire social system. So, and which ultimately replaces the socio economic system that is existent today. So, such changes and replacements and transformations are the result of the changes that take place in the production relationships. Productive forces develop faster than production relations and they may conflict with each other. So, I have mentioned about the productive forces they develop faster than the production relationships and there is a conflict. Resolution of the conflict happens with the replacement of the old production relations with new ones. In the example of feudalism and capitalism we, it is quite visible feudalism encountered certain difficulties certain conflicts within the system because there was a conflict between the productive forces and the production relationships. The society can no longer pull on uh, with this conflict. So, a resolution becomes inevitable which ultimately led to the creation of a different society with a different set of relationships and socio economic conditions. So, the destruction of the old socio economic formation and its replacement by the new one happens here. Marx says that when the social formation the socio economic formation actually happens uh, according to certain certain laws. So, what is it the result of the conflict between production forces and production relationships. This universal law has governed the entire history of human society this is what I mentioned about the universal law of history and uh, it governs all progress of material production and of society as a whole. And there are according to the Marxian view five socio economic formations which starts from the primitive uh, communal uh, slave hold uh, owning feudal capitalist and communist. So, this uh, figure will outline it, it uh, the, the on the bottom you can see the primitive communal system which encounters certain inner conflicts and as a result there is this revolution take place which leads to the next one slave holding again due to this conflict between uh, uh, modes of production and the revolution taking place which leads to the feudalism and again as a result of the inner conflict revolution takes place leads to capitalism. And now at present we are in this stage and Marx envisages that this will further lead to communism as the result of uh, a revolution. But then this stage is very important because when Marx composed his works the capitalism was emerging in Europe and uh, many European nations have already uh, witnessed rapid industrialization. He thought that the evolution to the next stage with the revolution it needs to be initiated by the working class. So, that is where you know he thought the proletariat or the working class plays a very important role the revolution the conflict ultimately reaches the stages of uh, revolution transition from one socio economic formation to another and uh, there is an intermediary stage of social upheaval which needs to be resolved that confusion needs to be overcome 
and uh, a socio historical and law governed process of development of human society. It underlies the progressive character of social development. So, we can see that a kind of teleology, a kind of progress, it is not just blind change, but a progress from one stage, then that stage progresses, the more it progresses, the more its uh, conflicts become apparent and uh, exposed and this ultimately necessitates a kind of uh, resolution, which happens with the help of a revolution, which takes it to the next stage and it goes on. Now, before we uh, really get into the last uh, section, uh, where we will discuss the problem of alienation, let us clarify a point here. In the materialistic conception of history, which is called the historical materialism, uh, there uh, Marx makes a distinction between the base structure and the superstructure of a society. So, this distinction refers to the social relations of a historically determined society as a total system, conceive the society as a total system. And every society will have a base structure, which is represented by the material relationships, like how different people are related to each other, the class differences, the proletariat and uh, or the haves and the have nots. And, uh, then again the superstructure is constitutive of the political and ideological relations, everything that comes into that law, politics, morality, religion, everything comes under the superstructure. That is the reason why many people criticize Marx for being an, an economic reductionist. He would say that the economic relationships constitute the base structure, which is very important for any society. So, this is the base structure, which is uh, the basis of society, the totality of the historically determined relations of productions, which is nothing but the economic relations. And uh, the superstructure is constitutive of the totality of the ideological relations, views and institutions, which I have already mentioned, law, the state, morality, religion, philosophy, art, political and legal forms of consciousness and the institutions corresponding to them. So, all these constitute the superstructure, which is based on the base structure. The superstructure undergoes changes in accordance with the changes, which happens to the base structure, the economic relationships. So, here there is a quote from the collected works of Karl Marx and uh, uh, Frederick Engels, I quote, in the social production, which people carry on, they enter into relations that are defined, indispensable and independent of their will. These relations of production correspond to a definite stage of development of their material productive forces. The sum total of these relations of productions constitute the economic structure of society, which is the real base on which rise legal and political superstructures and to which correspond defined relations of social consciousness. Unquote. This would also highlight the interactive, the dialectical element in social formation. The law itself highlights this dialectical and interactive element. Historical changes in the base are derived and determined uh, by the changes in the nature of the productive forces of society. The historically determined base in turn determines the nature and type of the social superstructure radical change in the economic structure of a given society produces change and radical transformation in the entire social superstructure. So, instead of saying that one is dependent on the other, uh, uh, Marx would highlight the fact that they are interactive, uh, one would determine the other and influence the other vice versa. Let us now come to the conclusion part of our uh, lecture. I would try to highlight two important things here, the problem of overcoming alienation and uh, the role played by the proletariat class in this process. As we have seen from uh, primitive communism to communism to the modern communism, particularly the stage in between capitalism and communism is something which Karl Marx says we have to act. The point of philosophy is to change the world, not to interpret it. So, here there is a need to act from capitalism to uh, communism. We have to change the society, because this social system is essentially exploitative, which takes away freedom from a huge number of people, the proletariat. 
So, we will try to see that the idea of class struggle which is again at the center of Marxian theory explained as a source of social development. Karl Marx would see the entire history of humankind as a struggle between two classes haves and have nots. So, the notion of class and the concept of class struggle is at the center of Marxian philosophy. So, the production relations are explained in terms of class relations as well haves and have nots and the two classes have different relationships to the means of uh, protection. Those who have those who possess the means of protection they own it they own the means of productions, but those who do not have the proletariat class or the working class have no ownership over the means of production. They are just selling their labor and labor according to Marx as we have seen earlier is nothing but the essence of man, because in labor or in the activity of production man realizes brings out something from his imagination materializes his imagination into the real world. So, in that process the essence is materialized and when you have your essence as your product in front of you and when you realize that you have no right over it your essence is being sort of taken away from you which means that you are taken away from yourself entire thing your freedom everything you have to surrender because you have no control over your life. So, this according to Marx is a miserable philosophical worry, it is a miserable situation which needs to be overcome. This is what he means by alienation and what is a class? A class or classes are groups of people that differ from one another by their relationship to the means of production based on their relationship whether they own it or do not own it based on that the classes differ and there are primarily two classes the class of haves and the class of have nots and what they have and what they do not have depend on the production relationships. Each class has its unique role to play in the social organization of labor and each class's mode of appropriating and ownership of public wealth vary. So, for example, the bourgeois or the, the capitalist the pro property owning capitalist they have control over the means of protection they own everything and the propertyless working class have no ownership at all. So, their relationship social wealth vary from the relationship of the capitalist. Emergence of classes in human history Marx here provides a very interesting explanation of uh, human history what he says is that primitive society the primitive communism which I have already mentioned in one of my earlier slides it is uh, it was basically classless where people lived in small groups or sometimes even individually and uh, where uh, they basically did things for their uh, fundamental survival and where there is not much of social progress uh, and the concern for social progress was also not there. So, people lived in small, communi small communities enjoying equal rights everything was common level of economic development was very low with social development and progress classes started evolving because you need to have very sophisticated relationship between man and nature and man and man. So, this kind of uh, situation actually resulted in the evolution of uh, complex social structures. So, with development and progress social development and progress classes also evolve you cannot operate with the kind of primitive equality that existed among our predecessors. Now, the fundamental dichotomy also emerges in terms of classes the class of haves and the class of have nots and in capitalism between the capitalist who own the property and uh, the industrial houses and the factories and the proletariat or the working class who are property less the struggle between them the struggle to overcome alienation. So, Marxian attempt is to explain this relationship between uh, the property on capitalist and the propertyless working class it is a kind of exploitative relationship. The proletariat are always exploited by the capitalist in the situation and uh, there is a struggle I and mean, there is a conflict between them because they are increasingly becoming aware of this exploitation and there is a conflict and as a result of conflict there is a necessity for a resolution of this conflict which Marx thought needs to be supplemented by ideas of alienation. 
because the real problem is not exploitation, the real problem is alienation and to overcome alienation, once you overcome alienation you can, you can overcome the problem of exploitation as well. Now, let us see Marx on alienation, Marxian theory about alienation is very interesting, he says that money is the alienated essence of human labor and life. See for example, a worker works for survival, he goes to the factory and works for his owner uh, of the factory and uh, according to Marxian theory what is labor? In labor or in production he is actually materializing what is there in his imagination which is nothing but his own essence. So, the labor or production is a production of essence, the product is the essence, the materialized form of the essence, but ironically the person who has produced the worker, the proletariat who made this production activity has no right over what he has produced. So, this product which is actually his essence is taken away from him, it remains over against him as is alienated essence which actually challenges him because it is going to be taken away from him and, and this he is forced to do this because he is actually selling this for the sake of money to the capitalist. So, money it is for the sake of money he does it and money here remains as the alienated essence of labor and life, money or man's alienated essence dominate him as he worships it because he has to worship it, he does everything for the money, he is ready to even give his own essence for the sake of money. Hence, money is a barrier to human freedom, so abolition of money is the only source to overcome alienation, abolish private property, because the root cause of this alienation, the root cause of this, uh, this exploitative relationship lies in the idea of private property. Now, again labor and alienation, labor is the fundamental activity of man which I have already explained, so I am not going to the details here. The way man obtains the means of subsistence by interactions with nature and the rest of living creatures there is no interaction, I have already explained this with the quote of Marx where he compares human labor or human protection with the bees or a, uh, or, or, or a, or a uh, spiders uh, weaving skills but uh, the, the, that is not labor, that is not production, that is quite following a natural instinct. In the case of man there is a creation of uh, something from imagination which is called production. Man's interaction with nature is labor which is an instrument for man's self creation by engaging himself in the activity of production man creates himself. And this is this becomes a perennial issue for Marx and Marx says that the central philosophical worry is how to overcome alienation and here criticism alone is not sufficient. He says that we have to see what has actually caused this alienation, the causes of alienation are certain material conditions. So, in order to overcome alienation you have to actually overcome these material forces which created alienation and these material forces which created alienation needs to be overthrown by material forces, another set of material forces which is supplied by the labors, the proletariat class. A force that can overthrow the system is the working class through revolution, he wants the proletariat to initiate a revolution, the famous slogan you have nothing to lose but only chains, workers of all world unite and the proletariat is a sphere of society having a universal character because of its universal suffering. Why proletariat? He identifies the proletariat as having this historical responsibility of initiating the revolution that ultimately culminates in communism results in a kind of uh, overcoming all forms of alienation. So, the proletariat has got a historical responsibility here because the property owning middle class can win freedom on the basis of the rights to property, they are already enjoying freedom. So, they are not really worried about freedom, they are not really worried about the problem of alienation, though they are also alienated from humanity in a very significant way. Propertyless working class possesses nothing they can liberate themselves only by liberating the whole of humanity, only by realizing the whole of human self in them. So, proletariat represents the whole of humanity, the whole of human suffering due to lack of freedom and lost essence, because 
this uh, very peculiar economic relationship which is exploitative where the proletariat is forced to sell his product which is nothing but his own essence materialized through labor. When he does this actually he suffers a loss of self, he suffers a loss of essence and also has to sacrifice his freedom. So, only by regaining this freedom and regaining the lost essence you can gain independence, you can gain happiness or overcome alienation. This can be done only with a revolution. So, alienated labor what happens is that the worker and the product of his labor are separated I have already mentioned this. The product appears before him as an alien object because he has no control over it, he has no right to possess it and it stands over and above him opposed to him as an independent power someone else has power over it and then he is alienated from himself in the very act of production. So, under such condition of production what happens is that you are alienated from yourself, the worker is alienated from himself in the very act of production. Since he has no power right or control of what he produces he is unable to view his work as part of his real self. So, the moment he does it, it is taken away from him he has no control over it. The work he does in cooperation with others make him a part of humanity which is uh, the human species actually in ideal conditions this is what is happening every human labor has a social element. So, this social element if you realize this social element in your individual activity of production that consists in the realization of your uh, of your social social self as well or rather you realize that you are becoming a part of humanity the human species. The species life constitute the social essence of man. In alienated labor this social essence is taken away from him, because there is he has no uh, option to integrate himself with the rest of humanity, with the rest of the human species. Here what happens is that he is alienated from other men, instead of cooperation he combates with other workers, because this again you know the supply demand equation that works in classical economics, even in the case of uh, in the market more the number of employees are available jobless the less the demand for them naturally the wages would come down. So, they are exploited there in terms of low wages they are exploited and uh, instead of cooperating with them they commit with each other because they know that the supply is more and the demand is less. Now, in the under such circumstances each worker would perceive the other his co-worker as a threat which is again the loss of social essence and overcoming alienation consists in resolving all such problems abolition of private property is at the core of all these issues. So, Marxism very strongly advocates the abolition of private property as it causes alienation from nature and other men seen what happens in private property once you are mesmerized by the paradigm of private property is that even your senses your entire perception of the world is controlled dominated by this notion of private property. You would not be able to appreciate the worth and value and beauty of anything in nature independent of this conception of private property. You always see it as something which you possess what will be the value if I possess it instead of appreciating its value or worth independent of being possessing it. So, this is the danger of uh, having this notion of private property at the backdrop abolition of wages and money this is another thing as I mentioned the wages will come down, but hiking the wages is not a solution rather the abolition of wages in total the abolition of money itself is the fundamental solution. In this uh, context uh, Marx introduces the dialectical materialism where the working class or the proletariat has the historical responsibility of initiating a revolution uh, materializing or nothing but bringing out the conflict that already exists in society capitalist versus proletariat classes. So, and ultimately this reaches to the synthesis of classless society. The dialectics emerges from the concept of private property and classless society both private property and the proletariat will disappear in that synthesis of classless society. So, the interesting thing is that the 
private property is the thesis and uh, propertyless uh, proletariat is the antithesis. Private property creates its own antithesis, because in order to continue to exist uh, private property must maintain the existence of the propertyless working class. And uh, to be propertyless is to suffer the loss of essence and get alienated, I have already mentioned what do you mean by propertyless. Propertyless ultimately means that you have no control over the product which is ultimately the product of your labor which is nothing but your own essence. So, alienated labor, alienated essence. So, under such circumstances the propertyless is uh, to suffer the loss of essence and get alienated and to overcome this the proletarist has to abolish itself as well as private property. So, unless you abolish private property because private property requires for its own subsistence the, the, the maintenance of uh, a propertyless working class which ultimately means sufferings, loss of self etcetera and this has to be overcome. The classless society which, which Marx envisages is nothing but the culmination, the ultimate synthesis of the dialectical relationship between the working class or the haves and the have nots, the capitalist and the working class. As we have seen in a stage of evolution or uh, social evolution, social change happens from the cap stage of capitalism according to Marx to communism, which can be materialized only with the overthrowing of the material forces of capitalism by the working class by means of a uh, revolution and uh, this happens by abolition of private property, abolition of money and abolition of all forms of exploitation. And uh, I would rather conclude by saying that Marx's importance is not just because he has proposed a philosophy which ultimately finds uh, a kind of practical application, but also trying to integrate with, with this practical application a very uh, interesting and a very important problem which humankind has been facing from its beginning the problem of alienation and trying to find a solution to this fundamental problem by providing uh, an account of history and how this account of history ultimately culminates in a process where man has to do something creative in order to initiate the process the revolution the proletariat has to do that which ultimately results in a classless society where all exploitations all differences all uh, everything is abolished everything is overcome. So, that is the importance of Marxism with this we will wind up this uh, lecture thank you.